Um, thank you very much, Chief. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, thank all of you for uh, having me, and I agree with Brian. Uh, it's nice to be in a lineup of uh, fairly iconic people in trying to make a difference uh, in policing. There's one thing that he did miss on my bio, I don't know if I forgot to get that to Vanessa, was is I was an advisor for the uh, Reno 911 show for years. <laughs> Lieutenant Dangle, remember him? Yeah. Uh, there's a story that goes with that, so we'll start with a little light humor. Um, as he'd mentioned, the Reno Police Department was instrumental in developing a new field uh, training program, which several small agencies in Indiana actually implemented the PTO program around 2004, 2005, and that's the last time I was actually here. Um, but we went on the road and taught the program across America to many departments. And as all of you know, policing is a tough business, right? If you're teaching, you got about 10 seconds. Um, and as soon as you get introduced, you're from the Reno Police Department, right? We had characters of Lieutenant Dangle and all the other characters that these people would buy and leave on the, on the front desk for us when we'd teach a 40 or 80 hour train the trainer course. And it was great. So I was, a, I was a young lieutenant, so I could have been Lieutenant Dangle. And um, I'd tell the guys on, on the teaching team, I'd say, hey, look, you know what we need to do? We need to do the four o'clock funnies at eight, because we'd always end the day with the four o'clock funnies. Anybody could bring in something that was appropriate and could be uh, used in the classroom at the end of the day. I said, because we're getting hammered on this Reno 911 thing, and we gotta, we gotta start early and just get it over with. So we'd actually start the class in the morning after introductions, actually the second day, with Reno 911 clips. Um, and that way uh, the arrows didn't come as, as frequently as they did early on. It's a pleasure to be here, um, obviously. Um, the chief had mentioned earlier this morning that uh, I was blessed to have authored a, a paper uh, just after 2010 uh, called Resiliency in Policing. Um, I'm not going to go through that today, but it basically covered a model that we developed at the Reno Police Department and implemented and they got national attention, <clears throat> specifically from DOJ's Officer Safety and Wellness uh, Committee in Washington, chaired by uh, then uh, former chief, uh, Daryl Stevens. Um, and they had called me uh, probably in about 2011 and said, hey Steve, would you come out and talk about a couple of firearms programs that you guys have uh, specifically with decision making uh, and shooting on the move and that kind of stuff and communicating. We said, sure, that, that'd be great. Uh, and about three days before I was headed out to D.C. to present, he called and he said, hey, Steve, you, we heard you guys have a, like a wellness program at Reno PD that you've been working on. And I, I said, yeah, we have. Uh, it's kind of in, in, in its infancy. We have some vision for its uh, maturation. Um, what, what do you need? He said, well, would you, could we split time, so cut your presentation in half on, on the firearms program and then talk about wellness uh, as, as it relates to officer safety, at least from the Reno Police Department perspective. And so that, that is what I did, and that's how, obviously, we ended up here today. Um, a lot of this stuff uh, in my PowerPoint has been covered uh, specifically by John this morning, and so I want to reiterate a lot of this data uh, that we use, but, but I'll tell you that um, I started to take over the Reno Police Department, blessed to be there for, for 36, 37 years, and started as the interim chief uh, right in about 2009, going into 2010. Um, and as many of you, all right, uh, especially in Reno and in Vegas, we saw a huge hit because gaming and service industry, right, was primarily our, our industry uh, and market in those communities, south and north, uh, at least in Nevada. Um, I, I saw that the Reno Police Department, the city obviously was gonna take a huge hit, but RPD was gonna take uh, about a 20% hit in personnel which equated to about $13 million in our budget. Uh, the Reno Police Department, um, again, has been blessed to have, have decent leadership over decades and really was a performance-oriented culture. Um, and my concern, of course, as the interim and then moving into the chief's position, was how do you sustain that culture of performance, all right, uh, if you don't have the personnel and resources that you had previously? And so that's what started this whole vision, at least for the Reno Police Department, on, on wellness and sa as a safety initiative. Um, you know, what's at stake, at least for me in, in 09 and 10, is, is the uh, resilience of our personnel at the Reno Police Department and that we brought the best resources to bear for them to go out on the street and serve, uh, uh, embrace community policing, embrace crime fighting, and, and increase their survivability. You know, we, 13 million for us is roughly 
uh, 60 or 70 police positions and another 60 or 70 civilian positions. John had talked briefly about some of this data, um, and again, I won't reiterate all of it um, because it's already been talked about, but kind of uh, it, it did, when we started to look at, uh, the state of Nevada has a presumptive uh, heart and lung bill for law enforcement and fire, uh, so you get annual physicals. All right, I don't believe Indiana has that uh, as a state initiative or law, but uh, many states do. Um, and so our people would get annual physicals, uh, fairly extensive ones, and that data would go directly to them, all right? Nobody in the agency would review that, and so it was up to the individual officer, uh, a man or woman, uh, that received that annual report uh, on, their, on their physical well-being to do something about maybe some of the corrective things, all right? We had a doctor in Reno, Dr. James Greenwald, which uh, Chief Pat has met, and Ian, um, uh, directly. Uh, he was an iconic orthopedic surgeon and then moved into basically medical and health management at a company called Specialty Health. And then what they did is they managed our workman's comp, and we had worked with them for years. And he came into my office and said, hey, Steve, um, these annual physicals in, in about 2009, they're great, but really they're obsolete because nobody's doing anything about it. I mean, you have no really authority to impose, um, you know, things that you want done with them. It's on an individual basis. And there's advanced testing available now that's, that's a lot more accurate than the general lab uh, let test, lipid tests. Um, and, and we think that we could start a case study uh, specifically using the physicals and look at the, the wellness, all right, of personnel. All right, so what do, you th what do you think the initial challenges were when, I mean, Pat had brought it up earlier and I think Brian did. So who do you need to bring to the table to pull something off like that that hasn't been done before, all right? Um, we brought the unions in, we brought local government, members of our council uh, and, and the mayor at the time and said, look, you know, there's some things that we need to take a look at. You're spending about $600,000 a year on physicals for fire and police and it's not really a good return on your investment because it's up to the individual to follow the guidelines uh, you know, delegated by the medical uh, provider. They supported us, we got funding from uh, our council to uh, start a case study and that's how the Reno program got started, okay? Some of this data I said that uh, you know, John went over but, but really the last, the last bullet for me which I don't believe was discussed today, correct me if I'm wrong, is the work by uh, Brian uh, uh, Via at, uh, on Tired Cops. You know, it was written, obviously, in 1996. Anybody read that? Okay, well, the chief has. You need to get a copy, all right, because it's more relevant today than it was when Brian wrote it, okay, almost 20 years ago. And it's relevant because we have smaller forces, less resources, right, uh, we're losing a lot of, uh, uh, you know, the support from, let's say, generally communities in general and, and some, some geography. And then obviously our councils and, and the governing bodies that, that we report to as law enforcement. The reason I like to hit on this, I think you understand it. But when we talk to risk managers and HR people across America, this is what's going to get their attention. Because a lot of times the decisions that our men and women have to make out on the street are not reversible. And it incurs what? Cost with that, liability, good or bad, good or bad shooting, right? Perfectly good shooting. You still end up in the litigation, all right? Last year, last year, last year has cost a lot of money. Overtime, critical incident, shift work, and we've all heard that from John this morning. Now with your forces smaller, right, what, how do you increase your capacity to do the job? Pretty simple math, right? You create overtime assignments. That's what we did in American policing. And so our personnel are, I think in this case here, it's 12s, right, Ian? Chief, you guys work in 12s, we work 10s in Reno. Um, so you're working your, your, three ten, your 312s, your 410s, and then you're, you're basically ending that shift with maybe one or two 10 or 12 hour days on overtime. And initially that making that extra money is, is a good perk, right, it's a good carrot. But what it does is you have fatigue. And so you have poor decisions, poor driving, poor shootings, and those types of things. We're not going to go over this as an interactive, but, but I mean, let's just generally ask you guys this. Do you think that wellness and quality of life for your personnel is a safety issue? I'm curious. I, there's a mixed bag on it. What do you think? Yes, no? Anybody want to jump in? 
I know it's after lunch, you guys. Come on, give me a break, man. What do you think? I see some people nodding their heads. Yes, some are what yeah. I really don't know. All right. Why, Chief? I mean, because every, every decision that you make is based on your, your physical ability to prepare, um, whether it's a decision, whether it's a physical, physical action. So your quality of life impacts that. And it's, there, there's no way that you can avoid performance-based issues uh, if you're not maximizing your health. Excellent. Any other comments? How about against it as a, as a safety? A con, you don't believe it is a safety issue. Well, since you guys are eating lunch and you're tired, I understand, but I'll share a couple with you. Uh, we spoke at the FBI Leeds Conference three times a year for like four years, and it's, uh, I, believe, I believe Chief's been there. It's 40 to 60 leaders in military and law enforcement. Some of them would say, hey, you guys, this is great stuff, but it's on them. They need to work out, they need to take care of themselves, right? Um, and so it's on the individual officer, man or woman, uh, wearing the uniform to make a difference uh, with their wellness. Okay, that's a good argument, okay? Um, but I kind of agree with Chief. I mean, if you want a performance-oriented culture and you want to sustain that, and as Brian said in his presentation, you want to develop your people, you're a smaller force, you're handling more calls for service, right? So the workload's still there. It hasn't diminished, all right, because you, you've knocked down 20% of your staff. You need to start looking at these things, I believe, progressively as an officer safety issue because it is the poor decisions that we can't reverse that cost us a lot of money and in many cases a lot of heartache with communities, if not the nation, in policing. Question we'd ask at Leeds, what's your annual budget roughly go around the room for, for your fleet, you know, millions to hundreds of thousands? Could you take a percentage of that, right, and not impact your entire force over the period of one fiscal year but over the period of five or six fiscal years. So you, what you do is you incrementally implement these types of initiatives over a period of time instead of what we like to do in policing leadership, unfortunately, is, oh, I got a really cool program, cookie cutter, what's it gonna cost me to do 200,000, let's just plug it in, right? And then you start to see all these things, you know, the, the failures in it, and it doesn't necessarily transfer to your culture, all right? And so we, we got them starting to think about looking at certain items in their budget where they might be able to cut some money and use it for a wellness initiative, all right, and then end up creating a line item within their budget annually over a couple of years and really start to impact the organization. Workers' comp cars, the chiefs, the leadership here probably understand them. Um, they're huge in Nevada. Uh, Brian mentioned uh, the number of hours lost. I mean, I was talking to Scott back there, and I said, you need an economist to do that because I didn't have my calculator out. What do you say, 51? hours, wasn't it, per, per employee, per so many hours of service, that, that's, that's one employee. Um, you know, if you've got 10 people on workers' comp, depending on the size of your organization, that, that you can incur a lot of costs over a period of time. And how do you calculate that cost? And I'll go over some of the, uh, the uh, CBAs that we did uh, in Nevada. We've talked about this today, this issue of insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome. Um, we started looking at this early uh, when we started doing advanced testing uh, and we kind of started out specifically with the NMR. And let me kind of go across the history of that. That was the first advanced test we utilized. Then we used the HDL Labs test, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. And then uh, right now we're looking at the uh, Cleveland, uh, the Cleveland Lab uh, system to, that will work for obviously uh, in the Reno Police Department and in Nevada. But we've seen the impacts of not just stress, but heart disease uh, is huge, uh, not just in society, but in policing. It's, it's three or four times that of, 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 of what it is uh, probably really paid attention to. Certain cancers and, of course, alcohol and, and certain types of substance abuse. Traditional wellness models, uh, we looked at several. Uh, I'll be honest with you, in 09 and 10, there weren't many in American policing. Um, and so we decided to put together a hybrid team and start breaking down. So we moved from just advanced testing to other things that you'll see in a minute that we thought would make a significant difference for our men and women. Um, the lab tests, uh, not to be critical of labs, um, but after doing this for about seven years, the, the lab work that we used for the city of Reno, general lipid lab work, was completely obsolete. It gave them a pretty general idea of where you might be, all right, as an individual, 
I'll speak to myself as an example. I jumped into the first case study, and I had had at that time 31 or 32 years of physicals uh, with the city. Hey, you're good to go, Steve. Great lab work. Your treadmill test is great. You're good to go. I get tested, advanced tested, right? My LDLP, all right, hopefully this doesn't TMI, it's just the truth, was higher than it should be, all right? So obviously I started to work with, with different, uh, you know, eating uh, systems, paleo, uh, Mediterranean, um, ketogenic wasn't really that big then, and I couldn't drop those numbers down, all right? So I ended up having to go on a low dose statin of about five milligrams because it was a genetic gift apparently from my father's side of the house, to knock that down to about 1,000 range. I was at about 15 or 1,600, all right? It would have been nice, and not to be hypercritical, it would have been nice for me to know that when I had about 25 or 26 years on the job. And so just from Reno's perspective, you have the annual physical, it's mandated by law, but is the information really that accurate? It's not to criticize the physical. Well, I think what they need to do in, in states that are mandatory physical states that are presumptive is go to some form of advanced testing. If it's Cleveland, if it's just the NMR, again, I'm not a doctor or a scientist. They need to use those things more effectively than, let's say, just general lab work. The initial collaboration, as I mentioned, started in 2009. Um, we met with the unions and said, look, we need to pick 15 people uh, uh, in the sworn category of the organization. Let's we'll start with that. Uh, and there was a variety of issues and, 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 and hurdles we had to jump through. Uh, HIPAA was one. Uh, obviously, there was a concern from the two police unions. We have a police officer union, a supervisor's union, that the information would be utilized later, potentially, in a fitness for duty uh, situation, and we said it won't be. Uh, and so we set up a, a confidential system to uh, conduct this first case study. So we selected 15 uh, police officers, looked at their physical. All right, and generally we're looking for total athletic studs and studettes, people in the middle and people that were a mess, all right? Nine of the 15 were at high risk for cardiovascular disease, all right? One of those nine was a professional triathlete. No offense to use Ian, he looked just like Ian. Lean, mid-30s, I mean, the guys should be on a Wheaties box, right? Uh, and I mean, when I saw it, I was like, oh, this, is, this has got to be wrong. This kid's got to be retested, right? And they said, oh, no, it's not wrong. It's dead on. He's, he's got some genetic gifts that he's going to have to take care of because he's obviously training. He's eating well. Uh, we talked about dehydration, or Brian did earlier. I mean, that, that, that's a big issue. But this guy was basically a professional triathlete. Um, and, and I mean, that, that, that got a lot of people's attention. Um, like I said, we used advanced uh, lipid testing and nutritional supervision. And, and gave some exercise prescription uh, based on those results. And what we saw and we presented to our council who had, each council member had donated a certain percentage of their discretionary funding to support the study, uh, which was the way we got them involved, at least that council uh, involved in, in this case study, it was, it was savings of about 10.8 million. So if you take those nine officers and you use the, the math in Nevada, all right, and those nine, officers end up retiring on the heart and lung with cardiovascular disease, certain cancers, or diabetes, it would have saved, obviously, the state and the city about 10.8 million. So what we did is we moved from, I didn't feel, and when I talked to my executive team uh, and the leadership team across uh, the organization, really, um, civilian and, and sworn side, when you looked at the program, I said, you know, this, is, this isn't good enough. Advanced testing is, is great. Um, but we need you know, this resiliency, the terminology we were using was resiliency as a path to wellness. We need to start looking at other things, all right? And so we advanced uh, the RPD program from just using advanced testing. We probably did three or four groups of 15 uh, where we used the advanced testing as a benchmark. And then we started moving into this more holistic approach uh, to doing uh, and educating our people on wellness as a safety initiative. Emotional survival, Brian had mentioned Gil Martin. Uh, he's been in our neck of the woods many, many times, and I'll talk about some other people we brought in in a, in a minute. We developed a wellness team within the organization. Uh, lifestyle management, exercise recommendations, and nutrition. Uh, and there's a lot of debate on the nutritional piece, but I'll, I'll be honest with you. you know, we have Rob Wolf living in our community. He's a paleo guy, right? He's kind of one of the paleo gurus. So he worked with us and, and he spoke at a couple of our annual uh, symposiums. 
But what I saw, and it's anecdotal, but what I saw with our men and women and myself included and my family, because we wanted a, the families included. We want inclusion with the families. Because it's one, you know, if I'm, if, I'm, if I'm eating paleo and my wife's not, right, and my kids aren't, it's, it's not going to happen, right? I can do it at work maybe. I go home and, and, and you're flipping it, right? You're going, you're going to whatever they need to get done. Um, and so what I saw anecdotally was really kind of a movement from a, a you know, paleo diet more to what uh, Dr. Kales talked about today. They, they, they kind of say, hey, look, you know, we need some grains. We need some good fats. Uh, we've tried ketogenic with a couple people. Uh, it's not to be critical of it. I know we're being recorded, but I've got to be honest with you. I, we didn't see that it was sustainable. And for the athletes, they had a hard time transitioning from that traditional, let's say it was Mediterranean or traditional uh, e eating pattern uh, into ketogenic, right? And especially if they were endurance athletes, they, they did just go into this fog for, for several weeks. Uh, they'd lose a lot of weight, they'd get leaner, their IR scores would go down, right? And that's great, but the problem was they didn't feel it was sustainable, especially if they were trying to do it at home with their family. The advanced testing, um, I believe you have my presentation. Um, I'm gonna mention some of these people. Any one of these people, they've been on the program from probably about 2010, 2011 on. Uh, they're all national experts that we handpicked to build a hybrid team to put the renal model together and then share it with the rest of the country. Um, anything you need from me uh, to contact these people or information they've provided us, uh, my email's at the end and, and I'll make sure that you get that information if you're interested. The advanced testing, obviously, uh, you know, we've talked generally about general lipid testing, advanced lipid testing, thyroid, inflammatory markers. There's, there's advancement in, uh, especially I believe with Cleveland Heart, on inflammatory markers testing that, that the NMR doesn't pick up, testing hormones, insulin resistance, and metabolic syndrome. Uh, Dr. Cromwell, Dr. Teradol, and Dr. Dayspring. Bill Cromwell is probably one of the leading lipidologists in the world, most definitely in the U.S. And he has been on our team from the beginning. Uh, he spoke uh, at the FBI conference nationally with us several times and, and to, to many uh, police, state police agencies like we're speaking today. Um, and what they really push is obviously this advanced testing and how that's scored. How do you use interventions if it's nutrition, exercise, and pharmacology, depending on that, that person? Everybody is a little bit different. Emotional survival, Brian had mentioned Dr. Gilmartin. Uh, like I said, he's been in our neck in the woods many, many times. And Dr. Eric Potterat. We had, uh, the Reno Police Department had a long-standing relationship with Naval Special Warfare uh, community, uh, basically on the tactical side of the house for, for years. And we had heard about it, the work that Dr. Eric Potterat was doing. He was not a SEAL, um, but he was attached to their behavioral sciences program. So he debriefed all of them and he built, you know, resiliency things within that community uh, for those people. Uh, we brought him in. He did a phenomenal job. Gil Martin's awesome. The thing that uh, what I found uh, with the annual clinics with our people, you know, three, four hundred people to including, sp including spouses is Eric, Dr. Potterat's message was right on point. And uh, do we have any former SEALs in here at all? What he would do is he'd put the typical life of a SEAL during a combat tour up on a PowerPoint. He'd say, look, here's what happens. You have pre-deployment, not to bore you, but pre-deployment, deployment, you're in, you're in the mess, right? Post-deployment, you're coming down, right? Here's where you're going. You're off deployment three to six months, depending on the cycle, okay, for the teams, depending on what team you're on <clears throat> and the requirements for that geography. Then you're back on the cycle again. He says, when I look at, when I look at, the people in my community, meaning the SEALs, and I look at law enforcement, they're more similar than they are dissimilar. And he said, and he had used some numbers that I believe Brian and John talked about earlier, the 72-hour window after a critical incident, all right? He said, look, you know, here's the deal. You're, you're in a combat zone. You're rolling with your boys, right? You're taking care of business, right? You come home, you're off for three or six months. Even though you may be in some intensified training, you're not in that environment. He goes, in law enforcement, obviously depending on the communities you serve in, you may never get out of that 72 hour window, all right? You're on 12s, let's say it's your Friday, you have a critical incident, right? You're a little jacked up, you're working overtime the next day, you have a day off, do you see where I'm going? So you never get out of that, that critical window of 72 hours. And so he actually kind of did a projection with both 
his community in law enforcement in America that was very interesting. Our people got a lot of takeaways from Eric. Uh, Kevin does a phenomenal job. Uh, like I said, we used him uh, almost every year. But Eric would come in with coping mechanisms. There's basically seven of them. I won't go over those. I'll get those to you if you want them. Uh, things like uh, the ability to compartmentalize things, uh, the ability to goal set, segmenting, all right? When you're working through something tough, if it's emotional, if it's family, if it's something on the job, how do you segment that? How do you incrementally manage that uh, where you do well, okay, in the performance of dealing with that thing, whatever it is, emotional, physical, psychological, physiological, um, and, and, and move forward. He has basically seven coping mechanisms. Um, the other thing we, we did, obviously, you can see there, we had annual wellness clinics starting in 2010. And, and like I had said, I, I really wanted to bring in some of the best speakers that we could find. And of course, that matured over the years. Um, and and we, had, uh, we changed our intervention system. John talked about that this morning. Uh, before, if you were an OIS or, or a tough incident on the street, You'd come in, you wouldn't get debriefed, you'd do your paperwork, we'd check on you, generally, right? You'd have a line level supervision check on you or a group of officers. And then what we do is send you maybe in a week or two for, to, for basically a, a psychological evaluation just to check on you. That wasn't, that wasn't with enough frequency. Um, and it seems like even with all these natural disasters, it's constant in policing and public safety in general. The amount of work we have to do in our communities and these things are, I think they're gonna continue with, with higher frequency. So we put together a team in the organization. As soon as the incident was stabilized, let's say we rotated shifts, we basically had the thing neutralized. The, the guys and gals would come in, there'd be, uh, there'd be a head shrink there with, uh, with the supervisor, and they worked, and what we found was what John said. They worked better as a team than they did as individuals. So, if you're the shrink and you call Steve in, how much do you think you're going to get out of me, right, about the incident? It's going to be pretty limited, right? The typical police, you know, wall of, you know, I'm tough, I can handle it. When they got in there as a team, that's not something that happened the first time. It's something that they learned. It's cultural. They felt more comfortable just saying, hey, this is what, you know, this is what John was doing. This is what Newsom's doing. This is what Ian's doing. You know, I kind of saw this. What, how'd you feel about that? And so there's this conversation that occurred. Uh, and kind of deconstructing the event, and, and it seemed to work very well for us uh, following high, high risk and stressful situations. The other thing I started doing right away, I, I, I know that uh, the chief does it, is, is I had this coffee with the cop thing, coffee with the chief of police, got an OIS, got a bad case, we had, you know, guy goes in, kills an entire family, we get there, kill him, it's a mess, right? You're cleaning it up. They'd come in and, and I'd have everybody that was at the scene sit down with me, and it was just coffee with the leadership. This, how you doing? What's going on? The system, how'd it work for you, right? The intervention system, or early intervention system. Um, and, and it was, you know, again, it's something that takes a little time. You're sitting with the old man. I never did it. I never did it as a police officer. You get an OIS, you get into a bad, bad scene, right? Um, I, never, I never sat with leadership in the organization. And it wasn't because I didn't sit with it. I just felt it was another barrier that needed to be torn down where they knew when they were sitting in, in, in the office with me and some of the leadership at Reno PD, they were a priority, right? And if they wanted to bring their spouses, they could. Uh, developed an initiative, uh, wellness policy initiative, um, early intervention for substance abuse. Uh, obviously, we've talked about the annual physicals and then psychological and emotional services. Eric did such a good job. Um, I had a retiree call me about three months ago and say, hey, 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 chief, uh, you know, is there any way, because Eric retired from NSW and he actually is the head shrinker for the Dodgers. Unfortunately, they lost, but <laughs> we'll have to text him and give him a little bit of crap, right? Um, and he said, hey, can I get Eric's information? Is he still doing any clinical work? And I said, I believe he's seeing people, you know, as an as need basis, but he's got this other job that, that, that takes a lot of his time away. And Eric actually spent time with this kid over, over the get kid. He was a retiree, but he spent time with this officer over the phone over something he was dealing with because he had left the organization and didn't have the assets that RPD had, right? I mean, you leave, what, what do you have? You go to, you find a shrink in your community, right? There's a lot of good ones out there. And there's a lot of bad ones. Or you reach out to somebody that you felt made a difference for you uh, when you were in the business. Nutrition, uh, we've kind of hit on that. Um, generally, what we saw with our people, probably 120 to 150 went through the program while I was there, is a, uh, you know, less complex carbs 
less bread uh, within your diet, not no bread, no complex carbs. And usually the carbs that would be higher on the glycemic index were the ones that, that we found our people kind of moved away from. Um, paleo was, you know, a big deal, as, as Doc talked earlier. Um, and, and of course, having wolf in, in our neck of the woods. Uh, but I just, you know, what, what I had seen or what we had seen was it's, it's tough, okay, if you've got a family to do that 24 seven. Exercise, I mean, you know the nature of our business. Uh, when the balloon goes up, it's, it's basically dynamic and anaerobic. Uh, so train the same way. I'm not gonna sit here and give you a CrossFit class. I mean, uh, I've trained my whole life like all of you do. Uh, and I, I kind of do what I think works uh, for me. Uh, even as a chairborne ranger uh, who just retired a couple years ago. Um, and, and what we're saying is, you know, simulate in the gym what you're going to have to do on the street. If it's strength, cardiovascular, strength and cardiovascular, right? And try to stay away from overuse injuries, which can happen with heavy lifting, uh, and, and just to say some of the components of some of the interval training programs. Uh, and those work good for younger men and women in law enforcement or generally that are doing that. But over time, you have overuse injuries. I was sharing with Scott, does anybody know who Mike Boyle is? I'm sure Dr. Kales knows him because he's from Massachusetts. One of the top fit physical trainers in the country. He uh, probably trains more professional athletes, Olympic, potential Olympians and Olympians. And he was invited to the SOCOM conference in Florida, Special Operations Command, SEALs, Special Forces, Green Berets, all, all those cool guys. And he went as an attendee. And when they saw him there, they said, hey, Mike, would you sit on a committee, we're going to talk about, you know, training. And he's like, well, you know, I, sure. I mean, he kind of got cold hit. So he sat on the, on this, this board, kind of similar to what you guys did today. And we're going to do this afternoon. We've got a panel discussion. So he started getting hit on CrossFit and he said, look, you know, um, he didn't want to be disrespectful. He said, look, if you're not training and you can get into a community of fitness like that, I think it's a great thing. Um, but for special operators, if you're in the desert, you're in the box and you're training like that every day. All right. You go out on a mission. Uh, you know, at 0, 0200 on Thursday night, and you have overuse, basically torn down overuse, your back, your shoulders, right, your upper body, and you miss that fast rope, or you hit that fast rope and you can't hang on to it, now you've got a career ending, if not a fatal injury. Um, he said, I just think that it's good, but I think you need to be careful about overdoing it, overutilizing it, especially when you're in a deployment cycle. And of course, that was for, for the military. Lifestyle management, Dr. Kurt Parsley's, and I've already talked about Eric Potterat, Dr. Kurt Parsley's was a SEAL. Um, and then he was, he was a doctor uh, and became a SEAL. And he was the one that ran all their sleep behavior. We've listened to that today from, uh, from everybody. Uh, we brought him in. He's a wealth of information. I would recommend that if, if you have a chance to listen to Kurt or bring him to your organization, if it's the city, the county, or the police department or fire department, get him in there. Because what he does is, like Eric, he breaks it down into these things that are manageable. And John, uh, I believe, and uh, uh, the doctor talked about it, and Brian talked about what's manageable about sleep, the environment, right, the amount of time, right, how you're sleeping. So get into a sleeping behavior, all right, instead of relying on alcohol and pharmacology. And, of course, he uses his former community as an example. Same thing. Pre-deployment, what are you doing? You're getting ready to go fight a war, right? In a specialized you know, unit. You're loading up on a whole bunch of stuff. Deployment, you're loading up, right? It's one ambient initially, then it's two, then it's three, all right, or more. I've never taken this stuff, so I couldn't tell you. You get home, okay? Now you're on post-deployment, it's time to kind of mellow out. You're still on four and three ambient at night, now you're drinking on ambient, okay? You still wake up at two or three because you're in like a two hour sleep cycle that he talks about that you get into with uh, these hypnotics. And he says, well, you know, what, what does the kid do when you talk to him? Well, you know, I can't sleep, so I'm gonna go to the gym and train harder. So now they're in the gym training harder on two hours or three hours of sleep a night when they're in a post deployment cycle where they should be trying to come down. So his job was to try to move them into a sleeping behavior, all right, uh, which doesn't happen like that after you leave the sandbox, obviously. And, and he worked with them for, for, for years. Uh, and he shared a lot of that stuff with us and it, it worked for our people. 
Family, uh, we had mentioned uh, earlier, uh, a couple of the speakers had mentioned the inclusion of family. Early on, we wanted uh, spouses. Uh, you know, if you had young, young kids, uh, 16, 17, could understand the material, young adults, uh, they were more than welcome to come. But uh, what we did with our annual clinics is the families were invited. Uh, we had a large number of spouses, men and women, and some uh, young children, uh, teenagers, young adults, that would attend and, and listen to this hybrid group of speakers talk about sleep, talk about, um, you know, here, here's coping mechanisms for decompressing and things like that. We set up several enrichment events, <clears throat> excuse me, two a year uh, where we would bring in uh, an individual to talk to the entire organization. We'd invite other law enforcement in Northern Nevada. The last one I did, there was about 550 people there with their families, and we had a kid come in uh, from SEAL Team 6 uh, who was on the raid, who was one of the three guys that, uh, that dropped uh, UBL. And he talked about what's the difference between being good and you think you're great and being great, all right? And so he didn't really get into the mission. He briefly talked about it out of respect for, for obviously, for the confidentiality of some of those things. But he talked about the difference between being good, thinking you're great, and working to be great. Um, and he did a phenomenal job. Uh, and so those enrichment things worked well for us because they weren't necessarily always about wellness, right, or officer safety. Uh, they would just be about generally holistic things in life that we deal with, right? and they work good. Organizational leadership, uh, you heard it from uh, the two doctors this morning. Um, it can start at the top, um, but you've got to have a grassroots effort in your organization to make a difference because those people will hopefully carry that torch forward, uh, similar to what what Chief Pat's doing right now in Lafayette. I mean, he's got, he's got two studies in tandem going on, and hopefully that will be carried forward, it will mature. And that was really our vision from the beginning uh, at the Reno Police Department and with Specialty Health was, it wasn't that it was a Reno program, it was how can we start a fire, all right, in people, in, in law enforcement, <clears throat> the leadership, and maybe in local government, to start looking at this challenge a little bit differently. You know, we always said, you know, this was kinda, this was kinda 1.0. Right? <clears throat> we did a presentation for LAXPD February of this year. There was about 600 people there, and they started 2-0. So they took kind of what we shared with them, and now they kind of modified it to work for them. And I think, you know, Chief, with your team, and, and you've got great local support, you know, I think you're going to be 3-0, if that makes sense. And that's kind of where we started with this thing. But it's got to start at the top. I can tell you since I left, and it's not to be hypercritical of the, the, the current head shed, but he doesn't support a lot of these more progressive things. He's pretty traditional. And so this thing's been watered down to, to what, it, what it definitely uh, shouldn't have been. I mean, it's just very, very general, all right? I mean, it was a national model. Now it's been watered down uh, pr quite a bit. Talk about the organizational team a little bit more specifically. Um, we created, as I said, a wellness team in the organization and task them within our strategic plan, uh, city plan, uh, to, to come up with a strategic plan, to get everything post-certified in the state of uh, Nevada, to build a train the trainer program in the state of Nevada. They've done all that. And so what they've done is they've developed policy, they've built a train the trainer, a 40-hour train the trainer program in the state of Nevada. You're more welcome to have access to that if you just want to take a look at it. Um, they have monthly meetings uh, with personnel and they're doing similar to what Ian and Scott's people are doing, is they're the ambassador to the program. They meet with cohorts of law enforcement and civilian staff. So we do it for both now, not just law enforcement. And um, they get to know these people very well. The people feel, feel very comfortable sharing the challenges of their nutritional stuff, the challenges maybe at home, their lipid stuff. I mean, how do I make a difference here with this test, if it's the NMR or the Cleveland uh, heart, uh, you know, and so those those guys and gals work very closely with a group of people. Usually, it's five or six uh, at Reno PD, and they host monthly uh, conferences. They're like 30 to 45 minutes. It's not two or three hours. That way, you can come in, right? Nail a thing, go home, or come in with your kids and and, and nail the the, the little uh, seminar once a month and and, and go home. They support now uh, the wellness uh, meetings, as I said, and obviously the annual clinics. 
and uh, they've, they've done a really good job. I mean, what I've found, at least my experience in policing is, we've talked about leadership at the top, but if you share and allow that leadership in your organization, they may not have authority, but they have leadership and opportunity. They will be the ones that make the difference. You do already. I mean, you do it every day out there, right? Chief Pat's not on every call. His people are. I mean, so the same thing applies for, for programs exactly like this. If you can share that and empower them, as John, I believe, mentioned, he said, what would be the biggest thing? You, one thing you would do, right? If you can empower them to, to get involved, they will, you will make a difference at the ground level. Um, what we've seen nationally when we talk about, let's just say, police leadership, federal, local, state, is when we present, there's a lot of attention to the program for maybe four weeks, couple of months, some people stay engaged. They adopt the program and morph it to fit their organization. That's great, that's what we want, right? And some talk about it and talk about it and talk about it. As Brian said uh, earlier, I, I felt his pain when he was saying that, but they never do it. I mean, he had a program that basically wasn't funded and look what he turned it into. Um, and, and so some leadership is, you know, they're good people, but they just don't have the vision or, or really the, the energy or, in some cases, the courage. It takes courage to do some of this stuff to, to move it forward. That's not critical. It's just the truth. And I'll close with this. It's just generally some, some rough numbers. Um, we talked about the early, early program. Um, and then Specialty Health also looks at Metro. Our, our south partner, the big, big metro, Vegas PD. Um, and as you can see, it's almost exactly what uh, Dr. Violante said earlier. He was at 27%. Remember that study over so many years, 12, I think it was? He was at 27%. This meta-analysis put us at 26% in, in the state of Nevada with metabolic syndrome or insulin resistance and a high risk for cardiovascular disease. The program was obviously started and recognized by DOJ, uh, as mentioned in the Pro Progressive Policing Initiative, 20, 21st Century Policing Task Force, and major city chiefs. And it's been, you know, it's been a blessing. I mean, I have people ask me, why do you still go on the road and talk about it? Because it was a passion of mine. It made a difference at the Reno Police Department when we were in a tough time. And I think it'll make a difference, uh, or you'll make a difference, with this type of information you've heard today. Uh, from all the speakers in, in your organizations. And so God bless you. Thank you very much for, for having me, and uh, have a good day. Thank you.